welcome to our three panelists. Welcome to you all. Each of you will speak for 10 plus minutes or so. And um, take it from there, Michael. Welcome back uh, to Washington. You just got here from Mont Rain this weekend, where he's now based. Uh, over to you. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I want to thank the rest of the, the panelists uh, for being here. Um, each of us is going to speak for about 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to address the ballistic missile challenge as it relates to NTCR. Uh, Dennis will be covering the cruise missile um, challenge, which he's probably the most prolific author about this particular issue. Um, and then our third speaker will talk a, a little bit about UAVs and uh, issues related to that. And, and then what we want to do is kind of open up the floor to debates on where we think we can strengthen uh, the MTCR uh, in terms of its non-proliferation goals, but also look maybe at areas where we might want to make changes to the MTCR where with no harm to the non-proliferation issues, um, we, we can, uh, in fact, enable uh, some commercial activities which benefits everyone, um, at least uh, on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, let me begin by just giving a very brief overview for the, of the MTCR um, so that everyone is kind of working from the same background. Um, I'm not the best person to do that because we have with us today uh, Dr. Richard Spear, who's actually the, uh, considered the father of the MTCR. There are a number of individuals that I see in the audience uh, that have been uh, practitioners of the MTCR, etc. So um, nonetheless, I, I'd like to just begin by, by providing a very short uh, background. In 1983, seven countries, the US, the UK, West Germany, France, Italy, Japan, and Canada uh, began secret talks on limiting the export of missile technologies. By 1987, uh, hastened by uh, events around the world, they concluded the negotiation. Um, and I think the agreement was, was reached on export controls in large part because we saw the increased use of ballistic missiles in the Iran-Iraq war uh, during the 1980s. There was a tremendous growth in the transfer of ballistic missiles from the Soviet Union, North Korea, and China. Um, there were burgeoning capabilities of the near nuclear states uh, in the development and deployment of ballistic missiles. And we, there was a growing concern by around 1990 um, about countries that were looking or seeking to develop chemical weapons that could be delivered with ballistic missiles. Now, the MTCR is not a treaty. It's not an executive agreement. Um, it, rather, it's a, a grouping of nations who have coordinated or aligned their national export policies uh, to enhance the ability to constrain the transfer of missiles and missile technology uh, to developing countries, and specifically those countries seeking nuclear weapons or WND. Um, the adherence to the MTCR um, were, were gathered basically to, and I quote, limit the risk of nuclear proliferation by controlling transfers of equipment and technologies that could make a contribution to nuclear delivery systems other than manned aircraft. Um, initially, the regime was overwhelmingly focused on ballistic missiles, and I think when uh, Tony Dennis talks, he can talk more about this. Um, but there has been a, a gradual shift to include uh, cruise missiles over the years. And in fact, in 1993, the, the regime was expanded to include not just nuclear weapons on the payload side, but also chemical and biological weapons. Warheads. Um, now, the regime in theory, it was not intended to regulate national space <coughs> programs or international cooperation on such programs, so long as the, uh, the efforts did not contribute uh, to nuclear weapons capabilities and nuclear weapon delivery systems. In practice, however, uh, the regime has placed severe constraints on the national space programs of developing countries um, because, basically, technologies for ballistic missiles and space launches are interchangeable. Now specifically, the MPCR regulates delivery, unmanned delivery systems that are capable of, of uh, delivering a 500 kilogram payload to about 300 kilometers. There are two categories of export controls, 
those that specifically um, deal with uh, developing or producing the ballistic missiles, and those which are dual use items. Now, there's been many critics of the, of the missile technology control regime over the years, um, many of whom really expressed um, concern that the, the regime itself would not be successful, the countries wanting to get missile technologies would always be able to get them. Uh, and I recall about 20 years ago when I was out at uh, Stanford working on this missile proliferation issue, um, there were people who believed, you know, 20 years ago that there would be a number of ICBM capable countries before the end of the century. I, in fact, went back and to see what a lot of the critics were saying in the early 1990s. Um, and to be honest, the pessimism they expressed was, seemed somewhat warranted. Um, I went back and I looked actually at the work that we did at Stanford. And we tried to project 15 years forward what countries would be capable of what capabilities. And our conclusion, I should say that first off, a lot of people thought we were overly optimistic. That, that we, we were attributing much more um, success to the regime than was warranted. But what we had predicted was that within about 10 years, the following countries would have intermediate or intercontinental range ballistic missiles in their force structures. Israel, India, Pakistan, Taiwan, Republic of Korea, um, North Korea, South Africa, Brazil, and possibly Argentina. Iraq was dropped from the list only because in the middle of our study, um, Desert Storm occurred and their program was essentially ground to a halt because of the inspections and the, or, or the sanctions that were placed on. So, if we look today, how many of those countries have actually developed an ICBM? None. It's not to say that Israel and India couldn't have intercontinental missiles if they were so desired. The fact is, none of them have developed such a capability. North Korea has tested um, a space launcher, which could be converted uh, with time and testing into an ICBM, but in fact, it does not have an ICBM capability. So in large part, the MTCR has been far more successful than anyone anticipated. Um, I'd like to just kind of uh, highlight some of the noteworthy successes over time. The Republic of Korea and Taiwan, countries that are easily capable of producing long-range ballistic missiles, are in fact dissuaded from doing so through a combination of U.S. pressure, the MTCR, and security assurances. You saw South Africa, Brazil, and Argentina around in the early 1990s give up not only their, their missile programs, but also their space launch programs, with the exception of Brazil, which continued with the space launch development activities. But the MTCR, while I think it had a large influence and it empowered the U.S. to make the argument to them to give up on both the space launch and missile programs, um, I think you have to consider also that there were changes in governments. Um, they, these countries dropped their nuclear aspirations. So the MTCR was actually kind of in, in a collateral way or complementary way, was able to uh, contribute to the, those countries dropping their, their missile programs. Uh, the MTCR has also been very successful in s establishing norms of behavior and convincing countries to give up uh, their missiles. I think specifically we look at Eastern European countries such as uh, Hungary, Poland, the Czech Republic, Romania, all were persuaded uh, under US and Western European pressure uh, to give up their <coughs> missiles that they had inherited through their membership uh, with the Warsaw Pact. Um, of course, the desire to be integrated with the West also played a significant role. We've also seen, at least those of us who are allowed to look at WikiLeaks, um, that the U.S. government and diplomats have used the MTCR as a pressure point to convince countries to block the transfer of certain dual-use items as part of the MTCR effort, but also part of you know, sanctions from the U.N. and other uh, <coughs> sanctions levied against countries like Iran. On North Korea and Pakistan, both of those countries have made considerable progress over the years, but neither country has progressed to the point that people had feared. Um, 
in large measure, the North Koreans have been constrained by um, a number of factors, including uh, the technologies that we're working with are not ideally suited for the development of long-range missiles. Um, they did agree to a testing moratorium um, uh, under some of the agreements that they reached with the United States government in the 19, late 1990s. Um, Pakistan doesn't have a real uh, strategic imperative to develop longer range missiles, or these missiles uh, capable of ranges beyond what they have today. So we can't look to the MTCR as the sole reason that they have not developed an intercontinental range missile. Now, I don't want to overstate the, the successes of the MTCR as a whole. Uh, I think we have to look at some of the failures. Today, we see that Iran, North Korea, India, Pakistan have all developed or acquired missiles of concern. We've seen continuing transfer of missiles from North Korea to places like Yemen, the United Arab Emirates, Syria. Uh, we see enhanced uh, cooperation between the DPRK and uh, Iran, for example. Um, and in fact, that brings me to one of the inherent weaknesses of the MTCR. While it has 30 some odd members today, North Korea, Iran, Syria are not members of the MTCR and they have engaged in a, quite a lucrative trade amongst each other to, to enhance their own individual capabilities through shared development programs to transfer of technologies, equipment, etc. Now, we've also seen that, well, in 1991 there were some real revelations um, when the UN inspectors started going to Iraq. And there was a realization that a lot of companies, say, in Europe were contributing to the Iraqi program through the trade, especially in dual-use items, but even in items specifically designed to contribute to ballistic missile programs. And through embarrassment and pressure, you saw countries like uh, Germany, especially, but countries throughout Europe, enhance their export control um, uh, or their internal export control policies and I think that has led to a great strengthening of the MTCR. Um, Russia before the year 2000 was a habitual violator of the MTCR, uh, trading technologies, equipment, um, you even saw people uh, traveling to countries like North Korea and Iran. Um, but after about 2000, uh, when Putin came to power, love him or hate him, you have to give him credit for having really constrained Russian behavior. And uh, over the past decade, you've seen uh, a much better record on the part of the Russians. And in fact, most of the transfers that are leaking out of Russia are in fact leaking. And I think they are somewhat um, illicit trade rings. Although with the corruption levels in Russia, it's not surprising. The big problem out there remi remains to be uh, China who seems to be uh, convinced that they can legally transfer a lot of production capabilities to a variety of countries, especially countries that we are concerned with, um, Iran, North Korea, and uh, Pakistan. Now looking forward, um, we've seen some fundamental shifts in the way people have pursued proliferation pro development programs in turn. Historically, they've relied on Soviet technologies, the SCUD engines, SA-2 engines, uh, the no dog engine, with the, which the North Koreans have successfully um, transferred to a variety of countries. Um, but there are some inherent limitations to these technologies. People have not been able to reverse them, reverse engineer them, contrary to some of the, the, the popular uh, um, opinions that, that are out there, the myths that are out there in the, in the literature. Um, but fortunately, the technologies that North Korea has acquired and has been transferring are not really ideally suited for ICBM uh, capabilities. Now there's one caveat out there, out there and that is the, the transfer, potential transfer of the R-27. It's a submarine launched missile that relies on much more capable talent. We just don't know to what extent the R-27 has been transferred out of Russia to North Korea and Iran specifically. And it remains unclear and I don't know that we'll really find out until one of those countries begins testing a missile based on the R-27 technology. But what we've seen in the last 10 years is a shift from liquid techn uh, propellant technologies to solid technologies. And there are two reasons for this. One, China has been providing countries with 
production capability. You've seen this expressly, explicitly in Pakistan, where turnkey facilities have been provided to the Pakistanis to be produced for the equivalent of the M9 and M11 missiles. Um, and this, this brings me to one of the weaknesses in the regime, and that is the regime does not control some of the technologies that are required to produce long-range artillery rockets. They fall behind, below the 300 uh, kilometer, 500 kilogram payload, uh, payload threshold. And as a result, you've seen countries like Iran take the technologies that legally acquired for the development of long-range artillery rockets and expand on, to accumulate passive knowledge, and expand uh, their capabilities to begin producing medium-range systems, which they're now developing. Um, and the concern, and you've seen this to a lesser extent in, in Syria. Uh, and while Syria doesn't seem to have the imperative to, to develop long-range systems, it will have the capability to produce as many rockets as, as it sees necessary uh, and might be able to overwhelm missile defenses that uh, are aligned against it. Um, the problem with, with countries developing this indigenous capability is that with time, they can develop whatever systems they want. This is especially true with uh, respect to Iran. Iran wants to build an ICBM to be able to do so. It will take many years, it will take a lot of money, a real commitment by the regime, involves a lot of flight tests over a long period of time. Um, and so uh, I, I just don't see anything that we could do today to really inhibit that, uh, that move forward if Iran decides to do it. I just want to close by saying that there have been a number of costs related to the application of the UCC. Yes, it has been very successful. Um, but it has limited the legitimate cooperation on space launch technologies with allies, like South Korea, for example. Um, India's space launch program has been limited by its inability to get technologies from the Russians. Um, and so there, there's a cost of, you know, commercial aspect to all this. Um, was it worth it? Hard to tell. But I think we're going to be facing some more difficult decisions when it comes to uh, cruise missiles and uh, more specifically UAVs, where there is a real commercial imperative and a strategic imperative for us, the US, or other Western allies to transfer certain technologies to um, friendly countries and allies uh, of, of the United States. And I think that we want to pick this theme up uh, as we move forward in the discussions in the next how do we balance the non-proliferation goals of the MTCR with some of the other uh, strategic goals in the United States, which may encourage, the, you know, might include the encouragement to transfer certain technologies, certain commercial products, um, and to enable certain allies. So with that, I'll close and uh, give the table the floor to, to Dennis to talk more about the cruise missile. Well, if, if there's a, a story in regard to uh, cruise missiles and UAVs, and here I'm focusing for the most part on the cruise missile challenge because that's been a major area of cooperation concern, particularly most recently. I, I call it a story of uneven controls and decidedly weak norms. Uh, compared with uh, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles and UAVs have generally suffered from more unevenly executed controls and weak international norms to the extent any of When the MTCR was created in 1987, the spread of cruise missiles obviously was a much greater concern than cruise missiles, which had yet to spread in any significant way other than anti ship cruise missiles. Nevertheless, both ballistic missiles and, and, and UAVs were subjected to the same Category 1 controls um, in the presumption of denial as meeting the specifications that might be mentioned uh, from the very outset of the regime. It was not in 1993 when many authors mentioned this in, in writing about the MPCR that uh, suddenly cruise missiles were thought about in 1993. They were there at the start. Um, however, the regime's authors found delineating controls on uh, cruise missiles and UAVs more challenging initially. And senior officials in the Clinton administration, and this is from a study I conducted uh, back in the 95 timeframe, 
rarely, if ever, included cruise missiles along with the ballistic missile challenge in addressing uh, that administration's missile non-proliferation policy in the public documents. MTCR members were uh, careful with respect to uh, sales of ballistic missiles. Uh, the U.S., uh, in its case, only sold them to NATO states. Um, while cruise missiles in UAVs, particularly in a ship, uh, were spread worldwide from st such states as not only the United States, but France and Italy most notably. Between the period 1998 and 2002, uh, a number of troublesome events occurred. And let me illustrate by, by pointing to three of them. The first was, and most perhaps most notable, was that of uh, the decision by France and Great Britain, but principally France, to sell the Black Shaheen stealthy cruise missile to the United Arab Emirates, notwithstanding several protestations, most notably from the United States, that this was a Category 1 transfer and deserving of, of constraint. Um, not just the subject to the presumption of denial uh, was the issue, but the low radar cross-section embedded in that particular cruise missile uh, had enormous consequences for nascent cruise missile defense developers, as well as non-proliferation experts, concerned with a precedent that might be established for sales by Russia and uh, China in particular. Uh, from some informal engagement with the various ministries concerned in, in Paris, I learned that um, all of the top officials recommended against the transfer, but notwithstanding that pressure by industry uh, brought uh, President Chirac to make the decision to sell it, notwithstanding its implications. The second illustration is the long drawn out negotiations that occurred in the early 2001 timeframe between the US and South Korea in regard <coughs> to uh, Seoul's entry into the missile technology control regime. Uh, we urged a cap of 300 kilometers range and 500 kilograms payload for Seoul's ballistic missile programs. Um, but we differentiated regarding cruise missiles by allowing them the option to pursue a cruise missile with 500 kilometers range as long as it was just under the 500 kilogram payload. Our concern was that there was a danger of fostering an arms race in Northeast Asia. Well, in 2006, Seoul surprisingly announced not only the development of a 500 kilometer range and attack cruise missile, but also two 1,000 kilometer range systems and a 1,500 kilometer range system. So the cat has come out of the bag, so to speak. The South Korean military also announced roughly in the same time frame a new preemptive strike doctrine in which these cruise missiles would play a featured role. And just to make certain that not just North Korea figured into South Korea's plans, news accounts noted that the longer range cruise missiles were certainly capable of reaching not only Pyongyang, but Japan and China too. Ironically, the reports about Seoul's activities um, currently in its wish to changed the agreement that was made in 2001 to broaden their ballistic missile programs to as much as a thousand kilometers in range, according to the press reports, uh, carry some irony, it strikes me. Uh, and that is because whether what we're seeing in the press is true or not, South Korea has already exploited Washington's differentiation with respect to ballistic missiles and cruise missiles with the three programs that I have. Uh, Line that are 1,000 to 1,500 kilometers in range and capable of meeting uh, targeting countries like China, for example, which is reportedly the concern that the United States has about broadening um, Seoul's ballistic missile. The third illustration uh, capped this low period, that capped this low period of activity with respect to cruise missiles in the MTCR was the absence of, of cruise missiles and UAVs in the Hague Code of Conduct. Uh, <coughs> essentially left the impression, which, which is the primary idea of the Hague Code of Conduct, to create this normative 
treatment. However, um, much the fact that it is not embedded in a uh, in a political treaty, uh, but rather just a statement of of interest on the part of the international community. But it left the impression that while curbing the spread of ballistic missiles was in the best interests of peace and regional st stability, by implication, the unbridled spread of cruise missiles was seen as less pernicious. On the uh, confidence building measure side, which the hate code was meant to deal with, we see cruise missiles, for example, being left out of, of the nascent efforts at um, confidence building measures in South Asia, where um, at first India had no wish to include them because it felt it had an advantage. That is, up until Pakistan in 2004 launched its first land attack cruise missile, and then India expressed an interest in having cruise missiles as part of that CBM, but of course Pakistan, now equal to India, backed off. Some good, however, has uh, certainly occurred uh, in the post-2002 period, starting with the plenary in Moscow, where very significant changes occurred uh, to definitions determining the true range of cruise missiles, which were critically important and were used, no doubt, by Paris to argue that there was some ambiguity with respect to the Black Sheep. Uh, technical annex improvements covered a much broader range of turbojet, turbofan engines, integrated flight uh, uh, instruments and navigation systems, and improvements in the Wa Wa uh, Wassenaar Agreement as well, dealing with uh, the possibility that terrorist groups might gain access by converting small airplanes into UAVs through access to integrated uh, navigation systems. 2002 was also an interesting year for what didn't happen. And perhaps the best way of explaining this is to note that in a Washington Post piece in late August of 2002, front page, there was a discussion about a leak uh, of a uh, Don Rumsfeld memorandum uh, that cut across the government, calling attention to the desperate need to improve the capacity to defend against um, cruise missiles. That story also included all of the shortcomings with respect to cruise missile defense that then existed, many of which remain to be the case today. And not seven months later, of course, uh, in the first, day, the first day of the Iraq war, Iraq surprised us with the use of a very crude Chinese uh, Hainai ship cruise missile converted for land attack use. Uh, and five of these were fired at um, uh, coalition forces over the course of that campaign. Uh, that contributed to three friendly fire incidents and the loss of three lives. Uh, ballistic missile defense, by contrast, worked as desired with a 100% uh, success rate against all threatening uh, ballistic missiles in the order of nine that uh, were fired against coalition forces. Now the standard for all cruise missile programs the narrative standard is to mention difficulty of defense as a key feature uh, incentivizing countries to choose cruise missile programs. The long-awaited surge in um, land attack cruise missile proliferation followed dangerously on the heels of the 2003 Iraq War in 2004 and spread to the Middle East, Northeast Asia, uh, and South Asia equally. Uh, we saw Iran joining Israel as a, uh, a country interested in land attack cruise missiles, uh, not least from its access to the Cage 55, 3,000 kilometer range cruise missile uh, illegally procured through um, uh, Ukraine with Russian assistance. Uh, and uh, a small quantity, as many as 18, falling into the hands of Iran. Uh, and uh, several other uh, programs that seemingly relate to uh, uh, China's assistance as well with Iran, and the expectation in a report just uh, in uh, the Israeli press that senior officials in Israel believe that Iran will, in short order, have a long-range land attack cruise missile capable of, uh, of targeting Israel uh, in short order. Whether this represents um, 
the fruits of the KH-55 exploitation. I kind of doubt if, in fact, any reverse engineering took place in my own view. It would, uh, uh, it would prove to be a model with um, significantly different features, but certainly uh, perhaps benefiting from what they learned from the uh, reverse engineering. In South Asia, both India and Pakistan, India has several new cruise missile programs that are experimenting with hypersonic cruise missiles with Russia's assistance. Um, and uh, Pakistan as well uh, has two new uh, land attack cruise missile programs with Chinese fingerprints. <coughs> the centerpiece of India's uh, new cruise missile programs uh, is a, another preemptive strike doctrine called Coal Star features uh, long-range cruise missiles as pr providing the necessary fire support for this, uh, for this new doctrine. Certainly China leads the way in cruise missile and UAV development in Northeast Asia, but all the key players are involved as well in South Korea, as I mentioned, uh, Taiwan as well, and perhaps even Japan has now expressed interest in acquiring uh, cruise missiles. Um, the, the, the last program I, I would point to is Russia's curious um, uh, but perhaps um, understandable in the context of the missile defense problems that we seem to be having with them, playing around with what they refer to as formerly the Club K container missile system, um, but also known as a missile in a box or a Pandora's box, essentially a 3M14 300 kilometer range land attack and anti-ship cruise missile comes in both forms. Um, stuffed into a container, a 12 meter shipping container, with enough space for two operators, communications and targeting uh, kit. Um, and it's being marketed and shown at air shows. It's been shown at two air shows in, in Russia. Uh, and it's been marketed widely on YouTube. Um, and there have been reported expressions of interest by our, our friends in Venezuela and Iran, among others. Um, with the exception of Russia, of course, the foreign assistance is a key factor with respect to virtually all of these programs. We probably put South Korea's aside from that, this, this comment. Uh, but the, the degree of foreign assistance is something I, I certainly discuss in my latest book called Missile Contagion. Uh, for those of you interested, uh, it's just come out or recently came out in the paperback and uh, it addresses all of those issues. From the U.S. perspective, the chief implication of all these developments is the need to remain steadfast in assuring even-handedness in the way the missile technology control regime handles both ballistic and cruise missiles. We're desperately in need uh, of greater even and this with respect to our missile defense policy, I also add. And for reasons of time, let me simply end on a note that the notion of liberalizing controls on large UAVs comes at precisely the wrong time in my view. My preference would be to use the less damaging but still under undesirable exercising of the rare exception clause um, to the MTCR, which allows for important transfers uh, depending on the relationship that one has with the recipient state. Um, or I would also give uh, uh, due attention to Richard Spears' proposal to look at UAV services as an alternative. Um, that is much similar to uh, the way we deal with the space launch uh, services business uh, sector. And I'll end up Thank you, Andrew. And uh, actually, thank you, Dennis, for teeing up what I'm going to talk about uh, in your last set of comments. Uh, Andrew mentioned that I had the the privilege of serving uh, in the Pentagon in the Office of the Secretary of Defense uh, sort of at the end of my time as the Assistant Secretary for Global Security Affairs. And what he didn't mention, uh, because I'm supposed to talk about this, it was that during my time uh, in OSD, um, the United States government worked for several years uh, on a proposal to change the MTCR guidelines uh, in a way that, and I'll talk about this further, but in a way that uh, in our view, strengthened, would have strengthened the MTCR 
uh, as a tool against proliferation while at the same time permitting legitimate commercial activity and foreign military sales that were, I think, not only in the interest of the United States, but in the interest of, of allies and of stability as well. Uh, and the, the, the changes in the guidelines would have had the effect of uh, moving some large unmanned aerial vehicles off of, out of Category 1 to Category 2, as Dennis alluded to. Um, and, but at the same time, would have captured some cruise missiles, uh, which in our view and in my view still, are inherently more dangerous and brought them into Cat 1. Um, and if, I presume this audience knows the difference between Category 1 and 2, but if not, I will come back to that later, lest to dip it over, leave you in suspense at this point. Um, the, the, the future of the missile technology control regime seems to me um, always, but particularly now, a, a very cogent topic. One is, I think it's worth noting that uh, we are now almost a quarter of a century after the establishment of the MTCR. It will celebrate its 25th anniversary next spring, which I think is a, a fairly remarkable achievement. And, and, and I think speaks very well of folks like Richard Spear, who helped create the, the regime some 25 years ago. Um, secondly, I, I think that it's clearly the case, as, as, as both Michael and, and De Dennis have mentioned, um, that we find ourselves in a world where there still are very determined proliferators of missile technology. Um, Michael mentioned the very robust trade among, for example, North Korea uh, and Iran and Syria. And I know, and, and this continues to be a, a, a theme, and I know that there were uh, press reports within the last couple of weeks, I think, originating in Germany and developed, which say that North Korea supplied uh, Iran and Syria with marriaging steel, which is an important component for missile skins and other things, and for centrifuges. And the press helpfully noted that this was just should have been controlled by the MTCR. Um, I think it's also worth noting that I, I think that the, 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 uh, the discussion of the future of the missile technology control regime is also timely and benefits from the good work that Andrew uh, and your colleagues have done here at ISS, the IISS, of, of elevating the visibility of MTCR uh, as an issue. Um, and, and engaging in a, what I think is a very helpful public discussion of this. I think it's, this, this discussion is also reflected now um, in an increasing, um, in increasing visibility and increasing statements from several leaders in industry on, on the impact of the MTCR on their ability to, uh, to export um, systems that, in that in the, I think in their view and in the view of others, would in fact be consistent with the national security interests of the United States and support, by the way, the President's desire to expand U.S. exports uh, at a time when they need to be exported. Uh, and I would you know, call your attention, if you haven't seen it, to an article by Gordon England, uh, the former Deputy Secretary of Defense several weeks ago, the former Deputy Secretary of Defense and, of course, former senior executive in, uh, with, uh, with Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics as well, uh, on the impact of export controls, which would include, and I think in this case, TCR, uh, on the ability to, of, of, the, of U.S. industry to do what, in their view, the, 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 the President and administration have asked them to do. Um, so, the, 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 I think I would take um, as the text for my sermon for the next few minutes um, a, a comment in a probably obscure paper written for the Canadian government, which said, says, um, despite the MTCR's at least limited success in curbing missile proliferation, or perhaps because of it, the MTCR faces challenges that make its future effectiveness highly contingent on its ability to adjust and adapt. The regime is based on assumptions and circumstances of a different era and has not yet adjusted to today's much changed strategic and technological environments. Now, that paper actually was written in 2000, 11 years ago. And so, I mean, if it was true then, it is certainly true in spades today. In 2000, I mean, if you were to draw a picture of, for example, unmanned aerial vehicles in U.S. inventory in 2000 on your bar chart, it would be about this big, and now it would be about this big. So, I think that it is clearly, the, I mean, I endorse this statement, it should be noted, um, and, I, and I think that it is, it is very applicable to the situation we find ourselves in with 
PCR today. I think, frankly, there is very little appetite in the U.S. government to change the regime in, in the way that was previously tried, but I'm going to talk about this anyway because I think it deserves to, to be discussed and, 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 in fact, is an important policy decision. So I, I would begin by just noting, I think that certainly during my time in government, there was general agreement that the MTCR um, had had some success. I, I think one can argue over the degree of success or the amount of responsibility or the proportion of responsibility that the MTCR should gain relative to other regimes and practices and so forth. But nonetheless, I think that there was general agreement that the MTCR had had some success uh, and was useful in helping to slow missile proliferation in, in several respects. One was, I think, clearly in the earlier, earlier years of the program, the MTCR did contribute, as Michael had mentioned, to the cancellation or suspension of missile programs in several countries. Uh, and Michael mentioned these countries. Um, secondly, partly as a result of this, the MTCR was then able to bring in country states that had previously been states of proliferation concern because of these missile programs. And most of these have behaved pretty well since they've been members of the, of the partners in the MTCR. I think the MTCR has also been useful um, in helping to identify uh, components and technologies that need to be controlled and how to control them. And so in that way, it contributes to the broader set of issues on or, or policies on export control, which contribute to non-proliferation. And then finally, clearly it's the case that the MTCR has been a venue for consultations um, and talking among partners on issues of common concern. But I think the question is, is there a risk now that the MTCR is becoming just another talk shop? It's great to have these conversations on, th on issues of concern, but is it accomplishing anything? Or is it uh, simply one more forum on export control? What is it that, that makes the MTCR, or should make the MTCR, uh, more than this. And I, my personal view is two things. One is the MTCR benefits from a laser-like focus on what is a relatively narrow issue. And that is controlling transfers that could make a contribution to delivery systems for weapons of mass destruction other than main aircraft systems, hence its name. And I think that this relatively narrow focus is one of its strengths. The second is the it, it, the second is that the structure of the MTCR guidelines establish a category of systems that would make such a significant contribution to the possibility of delivering WMD that they should be subject to a strong presumption of denial for export by MTCR partners. That is the, so, that's the category one of the MTCR, subject to strong presumption of denial. And I think that is a useful device which is different than other forms of export control. So I, I think it's important to keep these two characteristics in mind, which, as I said, in my view, are what sets the MTCR apart as a useful vehicle and <coughs> deserving of continuation as a gift adaptation and adjustment. So now, what are the <coughs> challenges to the MTCR's ability to adapt and adjust? Uh, clearly, you know, one issue is the, is the, is the changing approach of proliferation. So clearly there are determined proliferators outside the regime. One of the effects of the MTCR coupled with other export control regimes and uh, the regimes such as the Proliferation Security Initiative has been, I, is, I think it is now very difficult for a proliferator such as North Korea to export a complete ballistic missile in a way that they would have done before. I, I, I won't say impossible, but I think it's, it's, the, the, it, is, it is more difficult. The flip side of this, though, is that the shift in proliferation has been the technology components and know-how, things that are much easier to, uh, to proliferate, to, to slip through some sort of an interdiction campaign. Um, and and, and this, this challenge of trying to find the things that can be used to build delivery systems, technology components, know-how, and so forth, uh, is a real challenge. And, and clearly, it's one of the big challenges, for example, within the proliferation security initiative. The second challenge to the MTCR's ability to adapt and adjust, I think, is, is, the, is this ongoing issue of membership. Who should be, who should be invited to join? Um, there are key 
missile and UAS and cruise missile producing countries who in principle, or at least according to their public statements, adhere to the MTCR but aren't in the regime. So China, for example, Israel, India. Does it matter that they're in the regime or not? Are we better off, um, for example, despite China's previously spotty record and perhaps currently spotty record on proliferation, are we better off with China in the regime or out? I think that's a I think that's an open question, but, an, but, a, but a very important question for the future of MTCR is, is whether, bring, whether bringing these countries in matters or not. The, the third uh, challenge, and I think what I want to talk most about, is that the regime itself, uh, is the regime itself and the guidelines themselves, and whether they have uh, adapted and adjusted to the evolving delivery systems and threats. And in my view, the poster child for this challenge is unmanned aerial systems, and particularly what goes into category one. So I want to talk a bit about the challenge of unmanned aerial systems. So not, nothing has really changed. When you look at the technology and strategic landscape, nothing really has changed more since 1987 than unmanned aerial systems. Nothing better convinces the contention that the regime is based on assumptions and circumstances of a bygone era. In 1987, unmanned aerial systems, or UAVs, to the degree that they existed, mostly looked like, I mean, missiles, target weapons. Now, captured by the MTCR definition of unmanned aerial systems, you have cruise missiles, both subsonic and supersonic unmanned aircraft, which range from the size of a model aircraft launched by hand to vehicles the size of a commercial airliner, uh, unmanned helicopters, lighter-than-air vehicles, blimps, uh, that are not manned, and aircraft that can be either manned or unmanned, probably. Um, what are the characteristics of these systems? Well, let's see. The speed. Some of these systems barely keep themselves aloft. Others fly at Mach 2.5. Uh, maneuverability. Some of them have basically no maneuverability. They're big, fat, and, and, hard, and hard to turn. Others have high G turns that they execute en route to a target, which make them very difficult to defend against, as Professor Gormley has said. Um, some of these systems have very significant signature reduction, infrared signature reduction, radar cross-section reduction. And some are pretty easy to see. Uh, some are armed, some are unarmed, but probably capable of being armed, uh, and some are unarmed where it really is a stretch to see how they could be made armed. All of those are, kept, or all of those are captured in the, in the definition of unmanned aerial systems. Yet, in determining which of these uh, are, are such significant threats to be in Category 1, and as I said, I think this is one of the distinguishing features of the MTCR, one of its most important characteristics, in determining which of these are such significant threats to be in Category 1, the MTCR applies two and only two criteria, really. Range and payload. Uh, if the range of the system, regardless of all these characteristics that I've mentioned before, if the range of the system is greater than 300 kilometers and it carries a payload of 500, greater than 500 kilograms, it's Category 1. If it doesn't, it's not. So here's the dilemma. This is the dilemma we addressed in the, in the, in the attempt to change the regime several years ago. A cruise missile, which flies Mach 2.5, is very maneuverable and executes high G turns en route to its target to, de to, to defeat defenses, um, has had significant <coughs> reduction applied to it, but has a range of 290 kilometers, is not a threat that, that, that deserves to be in Category 1. On the other hand, a lighter-than-air vehicle, a blimp, that flies at, what, 20 knots, um, is really easy to see, um, doesn't maneuver at all, uh, but can carry more than 500 kilograms and can fly farther than 300 kilometers, is in category one. And an, an unarmed, very high altitude ISR UAV, the size of a small, of a, of a commercial airline, which again is not particularly maneuverable, pretty slow and easy to see, 
if it goes, and it does, more than 300 kilometers and has a payload of greater than 500 kilograms is, is category one, threat, you know, in this category of a significant threat. So it's, it's difficult, to, certainly for me to see, how a big, slow, easy to see, unmaneuverable, lighter than air vehicle, or high altitude, long endurance UAV is a threat to deliver WMD because, just because of its range and payload. And by the same token, it's hard for me to see how a cruise missile that flies Mach 2.5 as high G maneuvers, reduced signature, and so forth, but as an advertised range of 290 kilometers, is not a threat that deserves to be a category one. So during the Bush administration, we set forth to try to make some changes to the regime that would address this dilemma, this, this, this dual problem. Um, I think, as you know, the MTCR operates on the basis of consensus. So changing the regime requires a consensus of 34 nations. Um, one can imagine that this was not a, an easy task to try to get consensus 34 na nations to change the criteria. But the notion was, and I mean, and this is still discussed, the notion was that, it would, that rather than just range and payload, there were other criteria that needed to be considered in determining whether a system was Cat 1 or Cat 2. Speed, maneuverability, radar, radar signature reduction or stealth characteristics, infrared radar cross-section, and frankly, I think whether it was whether the whether the vehicle is armed or unarmed or, or could be armed or would be very difficult to arm. Uh, the, the, the point that I would make is that from, from my perspective, having been involved in this, this was not just an attempt to get some UA, UAVs out of the MTCR so the United States could sell UAV, UAV, move, I'm sorry, not out of the UAV, out of the MTCR. It was, an, it was an effort to move them to category two. So they would still be covered by the MTCR, but not subject to the strong <coughs> consumption denial. And secondly, it was not just an effort to allow the United States to sell UAVs. Uh, it was also to address what I think is this real problem with, uh, with cruise missile issues that, with these characteristics I mentioned. Um, what happened, I think, is, is known now. Uh, we were unable to get consensus of 34 nations, and we did, I think, pretty well. But in the end, there were a handful of nations uh, who did not join the consensus on the regime. And so with the, with it, this, this issue was brought to a plenary just before the end of the Bush administration, um, and there was not consensus in the plenary end of issue. My view is that, and, and why I am, I think, grateful to Andrew that this discussion takes place is that this, ch this, this change of regime, addressing these issues that I mentioned here today, still makes sense. I think there's no appetite in the U.S. government to take it on at this point. I think it would be a very heavy lift within the MTCR, but uh, as more nations produce unmanned aerial systems and or cruise missiles and or the relevant technology, this will continue to be an issue. Um, I believe that the United States government uh, should advocate for change, even if it is not likely to succeed soon. Um, I, I think, and, and why do I say that? Um, first of all, the U.S. government is going to have to decide on whether or not to overcome the strong presumption of denial for some key allies and partners who want systems, such as high-altitude, long-endurance UAVs that are currently Cat 1. So the U.S. government, if the U.S. government is going to release these systems to these key allies and partners, the U.S. government has to override the, the strong presumption of denial. Um, it's widely reported in the press that the U.S. is discussing with, uh, with the Republic of Korea the sale of Global Hawk, which is a Cat 1 system. My view is that it would be best if the U.S. government's decisions on this but these decisions to overcome the strong presumption of denial or not, if these decisions are consistent with the policy that the U.S. advocates within the MTCR itself, and that advocating the policy within the MTCR puts the U.S. government in a stronger position to make these decisions consistent with the stated policy rather than just on a case-by-case -case basis or on the basis of some internal policy that is not public. Um, and I do believe frankly, that it is in the U it will be in the U.S. interest and is in the U.S. interest to have friend, allies and partners who have uh, UA unmanned aerial systems for unmanned, unarmed 
unmanned aerial systems that, that, are, that are for the purpose of um, surveillance and reconnaissance, uh, which it, I think, generally speaking, contribute to stability and also contribute to the ability of allies to share some of the burden. Um, so my conclusion here is I, I think it's not, in, it's, it, is, it is in everyone's interest, not just the United States, um, it's in everyone's interest not to have unarmed ISR, unmanned, unmanned aerial systems controlled as if they were missiles. Um, and the MTCR becomes less relevant, it really becoming a talk shop if it's not engaged on these issues. Thank you, uh, Joe. And, and I just want uh, one point of clarification before we open the floor for questions. If you could briefly say, uh, comment on Dennis's recommendation that one should use the rarer rare exception clause, as I think you made the case for overall. Yeah. As I think, what I certainly have tended to say, was that I think the U.S. will use the rare exception clause, and the U.S. will need to use the rare exception clause for interests of national security where it makes sense um, that friends, allies, and partners who have a need for the capability and having the capability, frankly, reduces the burden on the United States for such capabilities makes sense. And as I said, ISR is sort of at the top of the list of such a capability. My point about the connection of that between the regime change is I believe that the United States is in a better policy position and a less ambiguous position if, in fact, the United States has introduced into the NPCR uh, an effort to, to make changes to the regime that are consistent with the decisions made on the case by case basis. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll open the floor now to questions. So I'll take a round of questions, I think, uh, in the interest of time, and then we'll give the panel an opportunity or two uh, to respond. And uh, we'll start with uh, Richard Spear. And the microphone's coming your way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll try to put a question mark after my statement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so let me say something about UAVs and then about a um, Another type of change that would be useful in the missile technology control regime. Uh, uh, Joe raised the um, pointed question about sort of what's the threat from a big, slow, easily observed, non-maneuverable uh, UAV. Um, the answer is, uh, among other things, uh, VW delivery. Uh, UAVs, including cruise missiles, are the best way to deliver VW. Um, you need to deliver it uh, under the inversion layer. You need to fly perpendicular to the wind. If you do it right, you can cover um, distances up to 500 kilometers with uh, 500 kilograms worth of uh, BW. Uh, also against uh, undefended targets, which most of the target sets are, um, especially in the third world where most of the wars are. In all those cases, Joe's um, uh, clumsy uh, UAVs are dangerous. Um, the suggestion I've made uh, a number of times is that we export not UAV hardware when it comes to large UAVs, but UAV services. If you look at the uh, IIS website, uh, there was a conference on this back in April. Um, you can see saying my, uh, my piece on the, on the subject. Um, UAV services give the customer the advantage of the backroom support that he wouldn't get if he just bought the UAV hardware. And the backroom support is what makes UAVs, especially for ISR purposes, really effective. Um, now, a suggestion for changing the MTCR. Uh, one thing that the MTCR does not cover well in fact, almost not at all, is penetration aids against missile defenses. It makes sense, given the purpose of the MTCR, to prevent missiles from being threats to carry weapons of mass destruction, that we prevent missiles from being loaded with effective penetration aids. I've written an article about this. It's in uh, Arms Control Today for, I think, November 9, uh, 2007. Uh, you can go to armscontrol.org and, and find the article. Um, but it makes specific suggestions 
about uh, controls that should be put on uh, on penetration. Question mark. Thank you. about there, but we're going to take Yeah, there, there was a forward. question there, right? <laughs> I'm Philip Hughes from the White House Writers Group, and uh, my question goes to uh, Joe Baker. Uh, going to the uh, plenary hill at the end of the uh, W administration, um, you summed it up by saying we didn't reach consensus among the parties, therefore end of issue. Uh, I may need a refresher course after all these years on the NTCR, but I didn't think this was quite like constitutional amendment where there was a uh, legislated drop-dead date by which if there hadn't been enough accessions, the process was over. Why, at the end of that plenary that didn't generate a consensus among all the parties, don't we consider that, well, we have as many as we got, and now the challenge is to get some more for, you. for the next plenary, the next time we can bring this up, and not lose, hopefully, some who've already signaled their willingness to go along. So I had the, the back row, uh, Greg. Good afternoon. Uh, Greg Timlin, Arms Control Association. Uh, Dennis had mentioned uh, the desperate need for uh, fairness in uh, missile defense policy transfers or something along the, those lines. I'm just wondering. Uh, what kind of debates are going on inside the U.S. government when it comes to a cooperative program with Japan on the SN3 Block 2 uh, Aegis Interceptor or with Israel on the Arrow 3 uh, Interceptor? Uh, because the view from China or Egypt <laughs> would certainly fit into that, uh, I think, category of uh, hypocrisy and, and uh, complete uh, unfairness. Why don't we uh, return to the panel for the first uh, round of questions? Uh, Mike, do you want to start? You, you can take any, uh, any or all or none uh, of the comments. So take, take your pick. I think what I'll try to discuss uh, some of the issues that, that Richard brought up, and that is, um, I, I agree that, that penetration aids is going to become an increasingly important issue, and that greater thought needs to be put in place uh, in the discussion of MTCR and what, where we might want to amend it. Um, I'm not sure that it would successfully get anywhere, but by bringing it to the table, I think you can raise awareness within the community of countries that are already members. Um, uh, unfortunately, I, I, I just don't see China ever adhering to, to, to these Environments when it comes to their sort of very important strategic allies. Um, <clears throat> on, the, on the services issue, I, you know, in theory, I would agree with you that you know, renting the services as opposed to selling the systems might be a, a good um, a alternative to, to making changes to the MTCR. But I would also argue that a lot of the countries that are seeking um, UAVs. Are like, not likely to want to have uh, someone with you know, a veto power over what uh, they'll be able to, to do reconnaissance on. I mean, I think that you know South Korea has a lot of strategic issues that are not perfectly aligned with the United States. I think that's true with the Germans or any other country, the Israelis, who might want to purchase uh, uh, UAVs or UAV services. So I think we need to take into to, to consideration the fact that. Yeah, services is, will probably be the requirements of some of our allies, but not all of them. Let me see. Uh, uh, Richard's uh, uh, intervention generally, I obviously agree with what he said. All of them said. Um, um, the, um, the question of why hasn't the administration, this is Joe's question, but I'll, I'll, I can't help but uh, remark on it. Why hasn't the administration taken up the gauntlet and moved it forward, trying to generate more of you know, broader consensus? And my, my gut feel is that um, 
one of the balking parties uh, is Russia, not least because of the 290 kilometer range supersonic cruise missile that, <laughs> that Joe was referring to is uh, primarily featured in its uh, export uh, uh, ambitions. Um, and a co-development program with none other than India. Um, and I doubt that India that is an adherent would wish to um, adhere <laughs> to, to seeing its market dry up instantaneously by virtue of that. So I, I trust that, you know, the, the difficulty of convincing Russia uh, to join in that uh, agreement is maybe uh, to inform the administration. On Greg's question, I, my, my reference to even-handedness had to do with even-handedness in the way we deal with both uh, the cruise missile and ballistic missile issue within the MTCR, as well as a more even-handed approach to U.S. missile defense policy, that is, uh, the, the need to, to make decided improvements, uh, not so much dealing with anti-ship cruise missiles as dealing with land attack cruise missiles where I think there are severe shortcomings, cancellations of major programs that had the wherewithal to provide some unique capacities. And, um, you know, and I think we need to step up to the plate. But uh, sadly, we're stepping up to the plate when the, uh, uh, the defense budget is going to go south. So the likelihood of, uh, you know, getting there is dubious if that's, in fact, arguably uh, much more doubtful than even after Secretary Rumsfeld's memo in 2002. Thanks. Um, if I could uh, sort of go in reverse order of questions. Uh, uh, on Greg's question, um, just to add to that, I think the, the two, I, I realize this was a broader question, but certainly on the two systems that you mentioned, that this, the cooperative development of the SM-3 missile with Japan and Arrow with, uh, with Israel, these are missile, these are defensive systems, these are missile defense systems, which certainly, which don't have an offensive purpose. Now, others would argue about whether or not you could take a missile meant for missile defense and make it offensive, as the Russians have sort of done with regard to European missile defense and so on. But I mean, clearly, I think with, and I don't speak for the U.S. government now, certainly, but clearly within the U.S. government, these are seen as cooperative programs on, on missile defense systems, very much defensive systems. Uh, on Philip's point, um, on the, the plenary and my comment about sort of end of issue, what I didn't mention, but obviously was the case, was there was a change of administration not long after that, um, which contributed significantly to the end of the issue as well. I mean, as Dennis said, I mean, for a variety of reasons. One was, I think, and, I, and again, I, I don't speak for the, for the current administration. <coughs> Um, one clearly was a desire for um, sort of the reset with Russia. Dennis alluded to, to the, the potential that the Russians might have been one of those who uh, objected. Um, and uh, I think it, you know the time it takes to sort of just do the change out, put new people in place, uh, and, and, a, and a desire to, and really a desire in the administration to, I, I think, and, and, and the president made speeches to this effect that. Uh, a desire to emphasize arms control with belief that arms control had been de-emphasized during the Bush administration in some sense that this would have, that changing the regime might have been out of sync with this notion of trying to you know, re-establish the U.S. And, 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 uh, to re-emphasize arms control. Uh, and finally, uh, on um, Richard's um, question, uh, <laughs> one, I, I think, um, the pro Richard's proposal of to, that that UAVs could be could could be marketed as essentially as services rather than hardware transfers, I, I think is a, is a, is clearly a, an idea that needs to be pursued, uh, and there may be some allies for whom that would be fine. I think that the more likely thing would be that the allies would say, "Well, this is great. Why don't you just give us the service, and we'll be very happy then." Um, I think, however, I agree with Michael that for a number of key allies who are the perspective. Uh, who are countries that actually might want to buy uh, these, these UAVs that are currently Cat 1, uh, that their intent would be to have these as their own, and I think they would be very uncomfortable with the notion of having the UAV controlled by someone else who could turn the switch off. Um, 
and then finally, um, on your comments about uh, I think your contention that sort of large, slow, unmaneuverable uh, high flying UAVs are actually a good way to deliver biological warfare capabilities. I, I think that reasonable people argue about these things. I, I believe that if you, if you look at the, what would need to be done, that, that it's not that easy. Um, and I think it's just, it's not that easy to take a system that's been designed to do one thing and then go make it do something else just because it has the payload capacity, one. Two, I think we're one to deliver, want to deliver biological warfare agents against an undefended country. There are many cheaper and easier ways to do it than flying something like a global hawk, which you know, cost you a, a pretty significant chunk of change to buy. Um, and so if you are a terrorist in particular, I think it's not likely you would go down that route. So, but but I, do, I do understand that there is an argument about this business of whether, particularly for biological <coughs> warfare, I think much less so for, 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 nu for nuclear, but that there is an argument along these lines. And, and but my belief is that when the United States, when that, that when countries make exports, under, the, under their own export control rules, for example, the United States, as well as the MTCR, the end uses of those, of, of those uh, systems matter, and the countries must take steps to assure themselves that the end use is, is the use for which they are being sold. Uh, we do this with, with systems with far more capability uh, you know, than an unmanned area, than an unmanned area vehicle, and with, with some degree of confidence. Thank you. Uh We've run out of time. Uh, we we're supposed to end at 3.15 and try to make a hard stop when we do that. I know folks are busy. But this was a great discussion. Uh, I thank all of our panelists. I thank all of you for coming some questions and comments. And as uh, Joe and Mr. Spear and others mentioned, this is a subject we'll have pursued. We'll yes. pursue the ISS. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.